Okay, so welcome to the next uh, Streams the Community call. Uh, so the first part on the agenda is uh, open forum questions and issues. And I think we had uh, Francesco connected who wanted to discuss how the memory settings work in uh, Kafka. Is that correct? Yeah, hi. Uh, more than discuss, I would say uh, understand. So I asked on the on the Slack channel, and because uh, it's not really my my field, so I wanted to understand a bit better how they work. Yeah, so I think the way it works for the all components apart from Kafka is that basically if you configure the request resource and request limit, we let Java decide what's the right amount it should consume. But for the Kafka brokers, it works a bit differently. And uh, basically in the, in the operator code, there's a limit of, uh, I think something around five gigabytes, uh, which, uh, it will use as a maximum for the for the heap, which is auto calculated, and uh, so basically it will take the memory from the request uh, uh, memory request from Kubernetes if you specified it, and it will try to calculate what the uh, XMX value should be for the maximum heap, but it will always try to keep it only up to the five gigabytes to make sure that there's uh, some memory left, uh, that not, not all memory is consumed by the heap, but there's also memory left for the for disk cache, which Kafka use and so on. Uh, Tom Bentley, is that correct? Um, sounds, it's been a while since I uh, really sort of looked at that code, but I think that um, fits more or less with my recollections, yeah. And so I think, the, go on, Jakob. Then, of course, you are always able to override the generated values by setting the XMX directly. Yeah, sure. And I absolutely don't want to do that, actually. The reason why we started to look into Streamsy was to avoid right doing that and, uh, and getting some best practice right around these values. And, uh, and so my, my only question would be, like, this 5 gig limit, even if I have, I don't know, say I have a Kafka broker with 64 gig uh, uh, of memory limit, this five gig limit for the heap, does that come from, I don't know, like your testing or is it like a, a well-known value in the Kafka community? Where, where does it come from? So that comes from, um, so when you're running Kafka on bare metal, um, it's fairly sort of standard practice to um, basically the broker doesn't need a lot more than sort of five or six gigabytes of, of RAM normally um, even if you're running it on you know a nice beefy machine with uh, say 64 gigs of, of RAM and you're better off you get more performance from leaving the rest of that RAM um, not uh, being dedicated towards the Java heap, but being used for the page cache, which is um, a kernel level cache, uh, where the kernel, when you read pages into um, memory, because you know you're reading files from disk, um, the kernel will keep those pages around. Um, basically, it's effectively a least recently used cache of, of pages. Um, and that works. Basically, Kafka gets a lot of performance um, from using the page cache um, to cache stuff at the OS level, because basically, if you're, um, yeah, when you do a, a read, because um, the broker's serving a fetch request, um, then those pages that uh, have to get pulled from disk into memory in order to serve that read hang around and so if you've got a bunch of consumers all reading the same topic um, then you don't have to go fetching from the disk of the uh, you know the second and further times um, in order to serve those uh, fetch requests from other consumers so that's why um, we sort of have that you know the the default if you're not specifying the heap size for the brokers um, 
is to use a maximum of five gig it's basically sort of replicating um that sort of fairly um is it best practice i guess it probably is best practice um for the behavior on bare metal if if that that makes sense yeah no it does it does and i expect most of you people running streams here for much longer than me do you generally customize the mx or this uh auto detection works well enough uh, certainly some people um seem to set the jvm heap size differently um but then i'm sure quite a few don't um it's difficult you know um we don't always know sort of people who are using streams don't often sort of necessarily tell us very much about sort of what they're doing and why and how they're using it so it's difficult to have a, a clear picture as to sort of how common overriding that default is um, and why people might think they need to um, so yeah it's difficult to answer that to be honest yeah sorry stupid question uh cool yeah that, that, that really clears it to me so i mean the recommendation is obviously sort of try the default and if it doesn't work um then you know sort of try um with you know bigger values if and see if that gives you sort of better performance but there's usually um quite a lot of you know performance tuning that you need to do before you sort of get around to thinking about the you know the broken memories you've got to tune your application first um and then yeah sort of start looking at some of the broker metrics to see if you can um tune the broker better um for the workload that you're running sure and again like for me the reason to go for for an operator now it's stream z regardless of whatever which one it is is to not do that right uh, we already run kafka and it's our own uh, you know stateful set and whatever and uh, and it's full of slightly wrong settings um, we're not really big on it. We don't have that kind of knowledge. So the reason for me to run the operator is to actually exploit someone else's knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as much as possible, we sort of, we make the operator, um, yeah, embed that sort of knowledge, but there are obviously limits um, because, you know, what people want to do depends on, you know, their their workload and use cases. So um, it's not always easy to come up with a one size sort of fits all um, approach, you know, build that into the operator. Um, so, you know, there's plenty of places where you can configure these sorts of things if you need to, to change what defaults there are. Sure. Well, thank you. Okay, do we have anything else for the questions and issues or do we move to the next section? Okay, hearing nothing, there are few PRs which are in the open PRs and issues section. Uh, let me open them. So one of them was the blog post, which uh, which uh, Jakub opened about the upgrade improvements. Uh, so I guess there is now some review comments from uh, Tom. Uh, yeah, so... I basically worked them in already, but I just need to verify one. Uh, uh... One additional thing, um, Tom asked me uh, if the operator really set uh, the version of Kafka in the CR when the Kafka version is not specified before. So I just need to double check that and uh, change it in the, in, the, in the blog post eventually. And then it should be ready to go. Well, it definitely doesn't set it in the CR, right? Okay, okay. So. Uh, it was just some mistake from from my point of view because uh, I probably miss or mess up some some tests together. So okay, I will change it in the in the blog post. Yeah. So if you don't set it, it's just using always the latest, right? What's, and uh, and the version what's the difference won't be set. is that the protocol and inter and the message format versions. 
they are kind of set internally and they are used during the update, but it doesn't modify the CR to add any of that. Okay. Okay, I will change it then. Thanks. And I guess if anyone else has any comments or wants to review that, then yeah, have a look as well. So then already last time we had this PR with the logo, which needed some changes into the design. So we didn't got anything from the author. So uh, I think last time we discussed that we might just open our own PR with the right design and close this one. Is that still what we want to do? Yeah, I guess if there's been no, you know, they open the PR and then there's been no sort of follow up, then I think that sounds reasonable. And just ping them on that PR to say that's what we've done and give them the option of saying no. Okay. Then I guess uh, I can do it because I already played with the code in the past. Then, uh, so the next PR was the the PR for the experimental Zookeeperless implementation. Tom, I know you left some comments. Thanks for that. Uh, but I think before adding them, I wanted to first understand a bit better whether this is really something we want to merge or not. Um, I know we had a, a conversation, you and I, Jakub, yesterday about um, the stateful steps stuff. And it's, you know, it's sort of which comes first, the chicken or the egg, it feels like. Um, there's not such a lot in that PR that if we didn't merge it now, you know, it's... I mean, we're, we're going to end up sort of doing work behind a, a feature flag for some amount of time. So in that respect, you know, I've got no objections to, to merging it and carrying on doing that. The question is, is um, quite what the sort of the involved in the carrying on once we've sort of done that, that merge. And, you know, I think sort of the, the work with the stateful sets is part of that. Um, and I don't know. So, I mean, I, I, if it was me, I would be sort of looking at the stateful set stuff first and trying to figure out. Yeah. So, to be honest, how that's going to work uh, from a design point of view, and then figure out and you know a plan for sort of how to implement it. Um, at the moment, I sort of feel that we're only looking at half, half of the sort of the. We need to get around our heads around sort of where we want to end up with this. Um, in order to figure out how we get there. Yeah, so to be honest, I see the stateful set work as a separate from this one. This one was really just an experiment from me. And while some parts of it might make sense long term, like the, the way the UUID is generated for the cluster and so on, I don't necessarily think this is the thing which should turn into the production grade implementation. So really my purpose for doing this was more playing with it. And then I guess at some point there will be different parts of, uh, of the puzzle where we will need to play with it, right? So uh, like, Right now, if you merge this and actually activate this, uh, the Kafka roller is all the time rolling the brokers because something changed in how the configuration is set. We know that the topic operator will need to be sooner or later modified to work with the zookeeperless Kafka and so on. So uh, yeah, really the only sense I would see in merging this 
would be to kind of make it easier to work on these other pieces independently, but not necessarily as this is the thing which should later evolve into the production grade implementation. And that's why I'm a bit hesitant about it because, yeah, I'm not sure really need this. Maybe everyone who needs this can build it from the branch or something like that and just use it, you know? Yeah, that sounds reasonable to me. So I guess I can maybe close the PR, but we will have the PR and we will have the branch to kind of reuse it if we need to do some further development based on that, on the other part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm good with that. Does it make sense to everyone or just to me and Tom? Okay. Silence means yes, remember, so. Yeah, I guess so. And then the Yeah, I, I did this PR. Uh, basically, I have a question if um, we are going to cherry pick this for into release 024 branch and uh, we'll do 024.1 or if we will keep it uh, for the next release. Uh, basically, the reason is that uh, it kind of blocks some namespace scope RBAC system test, which Mars is working on. And uh, basically, if we should uh, skip them and uh, wait for 0.25, or basically wait for, for the master changes, or if we're going to cherry pick both. To be honest, I think nobody complained about this apart from the system test, so. Just note for me. Uh... We need to fix uh, other metrics than just account of the, the resources. For example, uh, total reconciliation time is uh, wrong as well. I'm, I'm working on this uh, currently. Yeah, and I think we also talked with Stanislav about whether doing this through the shared map. Yeah, uh, the Toma, right approach. Tom, we proposed a better idea, and I have already validated it works. So I will uh, change all, all the metrics. Uh, basically, we will uh, put uh, new metrics for each uh, namespace, which is better to aggregate uh, in Prometheus than uh, in Operator. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So I don't know, Jakub, I think unless there is some special requirement, I would probably not do any new release with this. Okay, fine. So we will basically skip the tests uh, uh, in the PR from Marosh, and uh, when this will be merged, we can enable them again. Yeah, I think all we need to do is to discuss the timing, right? How much more time will Standa need to finish this PR? Whether, like, if we finish it today, then yeah, maybe the PR from Marosh can wait and then just rebase and see that it works. If it's longer and if Marosh's PR is ready, then maybe he can just disable the tests for right now. And then Standa can rebase his PR and enable them in his PR to see that they work and so on. Yeah. Okay, I think we can discuss that offline. Okay.
Any other PRs or issues someone wants to discuss? If not, then there are also two proposals. So one is the proposal from me about the drain cleaner that actually got all the approvals now. Uh, but there's also the other, uh, other proposal about a network policy feature gate. So from my point of view, that's fine now, but it needs more reviews. So please everyone have a look at it. I think the only thing which, uh, yeah, seemed like something to discuss there is uh, how should this feature gate deal with the with the phases? Whether we want it to go through the so it cannot really go. It just disables the the network policies. So we, for backwards compatibility, we definitely want to have it always enabled by default. But whether we should have some alpha, beta, GA plan in there, or whether it should go directly to GA, or what's your feeling about it? Yeah, so that made me think, actually, is this really a feature gate or is this just um, an option for the operator? Because the thing with the feature gates is uh, kind of they, they do have this alpha, beta sort of GA and then, you know, the potential to remove them at some point um, in the future. Um, because they're, you know, enabled by default or whatever. Whereas this, it feels to me, is, you know, it's just an option to the operator and, it, it you know, it's not got that life cycle quality to it. So that was sort of um, something that gave me pause for thought, really. I mean, the, the functionality I'm absolutely fine with. It's just, is it really a feature gate or is it an option? So I guess that's up to discussion. Uh, when I open the feature gate proposal, I think it more or less expects that there might be feature gates like this. So I don't think it conflicts with that, but if we want to see this differently, then uh, yeah, it's up to the discussion, I guess. Paolo, Standa, Jakob, what do you think? I will read uh, the proposal and uh, I'll see it up uh, later offline. Well, I'll make that comment on the um, the PR, and um, if we can get agreement, then. Uh... To answer you, Paolo, no, we can't hear you. Um, anyway, I'll make that. Um... Yeah, on the PR, and we'll we'll see sort of uh, where the other maintainers stand on that. And um, yeah, I'm kind of happy either way. It's just that did that was the doubt I had. So I guess the alternative, if we don't think it's a feature gate, then it will be just a separate environment variable in the operator which controls this, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, then please everyone have a look and think about it. Okay, I guess there are no other proposals to discuss. So the next point on agenda is the Scala 2.13 thing. 
So I think Tom and Tom, you suggested we should maybe move to use Scala 213. But there's this issue with uh, two things. So one thing I think which we don't understand is whether cruise control works with uh, with Scala 213. So uh, it doesn't currently. It's built on the 212 um, branches. But I've got most of a PR together for adding 213 support. Um, I haven't pushed that upstream yet because I just haven't had time. But it, it I, it's not it's it's not technically a problem. It just requires a PR to be merged. But the, Tom, the is the is, would... the is the metrics reporter which is running as part of Kafka dependent on Scala? As far as I know, it doesn't have any Scala dependencies. It's just pure Java. So in that case, it's not necessarily a blocker for us, right? It goes in the Kafka image. So no, it probably won't be. Yeah, but no, I mean, the so the metrics two. reporter goes into the Kafka class path directly? In no, cruise control's but, the same image, just with a different... Yeah, but the rest of the cruise control is a different directory. Right, yeah. So we'd have two copies of Scala on the same thing, but maybe that's not an issue. Yeah, but so we have two copies anyway. They will just be different versions now. Okay. And then, uh, so the main issue right now is in the open policy agent authorizer. So the, for that, we are using right now a library from uh, a third party library, basically, uh, from a company called Bisnode, which did a lot of plugins around Java and OPA. And basically the version which we use is compatible only with Scala 2.12. And uh, they have a new versions which are compatible with Scala 2.13, but these versions, they change the, the format of the input data, which it passed to the, to the open policy agent. So the way it basically works is with open policy agent is the authorizer prepare some data structure describing the, the action which needs to be authorized. And it's basically described as a, as a JSON structure and it's posted into the policy endpoint in open policy agent. And it basically gets back some response saying, uh, okay, this is allowed or this is not allowed and so on. And based on that it authorizes or doesn't authorize the operation in Kafka. And so the policy basically gets the input data structure as input and evaluates it. And when the, the input structure changes, that basically means that you need to update your policies to work with the new structure. So in a way it's a change to the, to the API between Kafka and the open policy agent. So I guess if we wanna move Strimzy to Scala 2.13, we have two or maybe three options to go. So uh, one of them would be to build our own version of uh, the old version of the plugin and just update it to Scala 2.13 uh, and uh, build it ourselves and include it in there. That way we basically diverge from what the 
what the original project is doing, but we don't do any compatibility changes for our users. I guess the second option is uh, to just uh, say, okay, it's third party dependency, then change it, what we can do about it and update to the new version of it and just warn all users that the input data format changed and they need to update their policies. And that way we basically continue to be in sync with the third party project. Uh, and uh, yeah, we basically break the API in a sense. And I guess the third option we discussed before was that in theory we can do both and combine both uh, so we can rebuild the old one old version with scala 213 and then have the new one as well and let the users basically choose which one will be used which might be a bit complicated because they would need to use different class names or something like that so i guess we need to decide which way we want to go there to be honest, the, the idea to somehow put together both versions and let the users choose, that seems like a bit over complication to me, especially if it has some collisions to the class names and so on, which we would need to deal with. Yeah, I mean, the standard way of dealing with that in Java would just be to use a separate class loader, but that's a world of uh, its own um, kind of special pain. Um, so, it's yeah, I mean, it's difficult because I hate to uh, break compatibility, um, but it seems like, it, yeah, it would be quite a lot of effort to maintain compatibility um, in this case and I don't think we really want to go um, forking the upstream project um, so I guess I'm a bit inclined to just on this occasion saying um, that we upgrade to the newer version of the upstream project and people just have to fix up their policies to cope um, which is, I think, pretty much what the upstream project sort of um, the release notes sort of suggested. Um, it kind of suggested that there was a way of, of writing a policy um, in the old version that would work with the new version. Um, so there is, you know, some sort of an upgrade story there. Though I yeah, dig the, into the details. The regular language is quite powerful. So you can certainly write your policy the way that it can handle both input formats or for example kind of compares the values or converts the values between them or something like that so i think you can definitely make the policy work with both it's still something you need to do right so yeah it doesn't yeah. really solve the compatibility issue but it makes it if you know about it and if you are ready for it it makes it possible to kind of deal with it I think I think we should do that on this occasion. Anyone else have any opinions? Maybe Paolo has an opinion, but we can't hear him, so. Well, uh, I originally posted some question about it in Slack, so I can kind of repost it and note the uh, plan we decided on and give anyone chance to protest. 
Then we Sounds can good. A few more, few more days if someone comes back. Yeah. Uh, let me just document it here. Okay, so I guess that's it for Scala 213 or? So then the next point, uh, and we wanted last time to talk it, about it when Paolo is here, is the 1.0 release for the bridge. Now, not sure how easy that will be if Paolo's audio doesn't work. But Paolo, so what do you think about 1.0 release for bridge? He says he agrees with it. So I guess one of the, so maybe just to repeat my thoughts from last time. I know we did some work to add the admin API, but there doesn't seem to be that much work going on to add more features. So I'm not sure we should see that as a blocker from 1.0. <clears throat> and then uh, I guess the ad another thing is the set of the work around AMQP and the new streaming protocol. But I guess without being clear when exactly we get to it, I'm not sure we should call it a blocker for 1.0 release or Okay, so I guess Paul is fine with it. Anyone else has a has something against it? So no, I, I think say, all core uh, functionality is good. It's there, you know, the HTTP part, which is, um, yeah, I think it's good enough to call 1.0. So I think we should give it more time to see how the 0.22 version, which we released recently, and which is used only in streams 0.24 works, if someone finds some bugs or anything. And after some time, we can do the 1.0. Sounds like a plan. And there is one issue with uh, return codes uh, when the Kafka is not uh, available, but uh, there was not done any progress. Do you think we need to fix those issues or? Are we okay with current state? Okay.
Okay, so that sounds like a plan. <clears throat> Any other questions to the 1.0 releases? So if not, then the next topic is the test container. And I see we have Marosh as well. So yeah, I wanted to discuss it already last time, but Marosh wasn't here and I think Jakub wasn't here either. So I think the way we have the, the test container right now doesn't really work. It doesn't fit into the into the CI pipeline. And for example, now in the releases, we basically have to disable the test container tests in order to pass the release because uh, yeah, there's basically no way how to test it before the release because before the release, the images are not there and so on. So that's, I think one issue which we have. Uh, another issue is that it seems to have very little configurability. So when I, for example, was updating the Kafka bridge to Kafka 2.8 and wanted to use the test container for the integration tests, then it needs, the tests need variety of different configuration options like one node, multiple Kafka nodes, uh, multiple Kafka nodes with these settings, multiple Kafka nodes with that settings. And that didn't really seem to be possible with the test container. And then the next issue is that it seems to quite heavily rely on Docker Hub and everywhere it's used, we seem to run into issues with uh, the Docker Hub limits for the different help containers and different other weird things it seems to be doing. So I guess we should discuss whether this really adds some value and whether we should still have it. If we want to have it, then yeah, I guess the solution to the build and test issues would be to have it in a separate repository and basically update it asynchronously after the releases and release it kind of, we can release it together uh like the day after the operator's release or something like that uh but it makes me a bit question the value because anyway the way it is today the way it would be if it has a separate repository the way it's configurable right now for me basically means that it's for example useless for any tests in the operator uh operator branch so operator repository so like why do we have a test container which cannot be really used for the integration test of topic operator or user operator and so on and we then need to spend with every kafka upgrade a lot of time figuring out what change in the debezium test cluster or in the embedded kafka cluster from kafka streams and then spend another effort into fighting with some test container when uh, yeah, we even cannot use it in our own test. So I guess that's the thing to discuss and decide what to do with it. I think I don't have any strong opinion on that. In case we will decide to drop the test container, I, I will be fine with that. Uh, basically, the reason why we implemented it was uh, uh, because the bridge, I think, because we use uh, use the test container in the bridge. And as far as I know, uh, project Apicuro registry use uh, test container from Stimzy as well. So. I think there is two ways how to handle it. Like uh, as you said, uh, Jakub, uh, uh, maybe we should consider to implement uh, more uh, to be able or to be more elegant with this configuration stuff, and to be also able to integrate somehow with the integration tests. But the other way is just 
to drop, but I'm, I don't know, like, is it, is it worth to investigate and to uh, create more robust and um, um, like configurable this container? I don't know if it's worth of time, but if there is teams that are using this test container, I think that's it's one thing. Like uh, I know that there is uh, like most of the work is the issue of the building, and we know that uh, this container is uh, dependent on the our um, release during the effect. So I don't know. Maybe I can take a look at how it will be like, uh, or how to build more con uh, configurable. So Maros, do you think you can take time till the next community call in two weeks and see if you can come up with some solution for these issues? Yeah, that's, that sounds good. And Jakub, just to answer your point, it is used in the bridge tests, but just in some of them, like there's half of the integration tests is not using it. Okay. And that's exactly where I actually run into the issue with it not being configurable enough for that. So yeah, Marosh, for that part, that might be a good place to look into. Okay, so anyone has anything to the test container future today? If not, then the next point on the agenda is uh, Litmus Chaos. Jakub, I guess over to you. Yes, uh, this will be more or less uh, just a heads up. Uh, basically, um, uh, we started. Uh, some discussions with the uh, Litmus Chaos team, how to implement some streams related uh, scenarios, or uh, we don't need to directly implement it into, into their uh, Go experiments, but we can basically reuse the existing ones, uh, improve their readiness probes and some additional checks, and basically create some kind of baseline for, uh, uh, for Streamzy. And uh, basically what I want to ask you guys to think about some, some specific Streamzy scenarios. We can discuss this uh, next uh, next Streamzy community call. I will also prepare some document with some uh, basic ideas which I currently have. And uh, uh, basically after that we will be able to proceed with uh, implementation or with some uh, uh, with some guide or something which will be useful for for us in system tests for example or in some specific pipelines which we can prepare or it will be useful for community as well uh yeah that's that's basically it i think uh my first uh, idea was to basically kind of implement uh the steps which we currently use in uh, the recovery system tests. So it's something like uh, delete uh, specific ports, delete stateful set, delete services, secrets, so on, to see that uh, the operator is able to recover from deletion like that. Uh, one possible scenario could be, uh, for example, delete ports during uh, the rolling updates or delete secrets and see if, uh, if Kafka is operational and so on. So I think uh, we can discuss that, think about it and uh, see if we can we can uh, come with some, some scenarios and uh, later 
me or someone else will try to implement it and use uh, reality to scales. This might yeah. be quite useful if we get rid of the stateful sets one day, as more okay. and more of this thing will be dependent on the operator and not just on Kubernetes, I guess. Yeah. Great to see the progress in that. Thanks. Okay, anyone has anything else? Hearing nothing, I guess that's it for today. It's anyway, a long meeting and we are almost running out of time. Thanks for coming. Cheers, folks. Thanks, folks.